Your changes and my changes are parallel, though we are not touching. The first state was a raw faith in objects. They seem to appear to us by means of our judgments and perceptions. In order to make sense, this first state required faith in a transcendental consciousness. Somehow capable of seeing matters a priori, or as they really are. The second state was a recognition that everyone is always a social subject, and any sense we make is always produced through existing frameworks. So, okay, that shit is obvious. What I wanted to do, though, is describe being in the world as an opening, you know, a constant dispersal, as if through the many rooms of a house, each with its own purpose or reasoning for being in that space-time in certain ways, say, caring to be there. Yes, uh, I think caring is the word. So it is always in a way, and for reasons of. And reasonings about. Meaning or mattering. That um, some things or matters come to appe into appearance at all. Come into appearance at all. So then we have to wonder, what are the mechanisms? It seems like there are so many of reason or desire, attachment, cause, need, what technologies say are producing these social frameworks that make some matters meaningful to be with, to come with us.
Um, Martin decided to take the job um, because their idea of security um, is to have the income and to be able to buy Christmas presents for other people. there's two kinds of nihilism. One is this essential nihilism that is supposed to be positive. It's a positive nihilism. It's the matter of being with a capital B itself. And that's the state that helps us avoid grief because we're becoming one with the universe. It's a very basic um, uh, idealist idea, um, idealist conception of being in its most fundamental nothingness of everythingness. And then the other kind of nihilism is basically what would probably be better term, termed contempt in a contemporary context by like Achille Mbembe, like it's necropolitics, like the technology or that, uh, that kills, um, that cuts off all the other possibilities, that creates these inframings, that inframes, therefore um, concealing the essential being while producing uh, the nihilistic being that causes grief, right? So that's two kinds of nihilism. Um, so I guess my question then um, is uh, what kinds of technological modes of being um, are in framing this uh, negative concealing and positive revealing 
of the grief causing. So let's just call those the bad ways of being, right? The bad nihilism. What are the techno what are the technologies or ways of being that are causing the bad ways of being? And then what are the ways of being that become one with the the nihil, um, this sort of uh, essential natural being that is framed as positive nihil nihilism. Well, isn't the odd isn't the, isn't the answer that really obvious? Would like you, the negative ones are capitalism, white supremacy, patriarchy, racial capitalism, on and on and on. Like all of that, all the bad and the good. The good thing is the human spirit, if there is such a thing. And that's it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean that's all very well and good, but those terms in and of themselves are technologies. So the terms aren't the ways of being that are producing those ways of being. We have to go into, this is why we have to go into actions themselves. Um, because calling something racial capitalism um, and then parsing all the uh, productivities of that in framing, um, in Heidegger's terms, produces it that itself. Um, so we have to ask, and this is why metaphysics exists at all is to attempt to move beneath or inside or or above, you know, to, to position the body and its reasoning or inquiring processes um, in, it, with, in another relationship to modes of being. Mm -hmm. So uh, Martin spends, you know, books and books and books trying to figure out not like, um, like what are whitely ways of being, for example, like not asking questions like, that are answered by, well, you know, focusing on productivity, uh, specialization. He's not Marx, he's not a political philosopher. So he's, he's not describing um, the political mechanisms of these inframings or these technologies. He's talking about the modes of being that produce these inframings. So what kinds of, uh, w like what though, um, or how though, um, being would feel, I guess? And this is where I get incredibly confused. Um, I'm not sure at all what the what a mode of being is on that level, um, and I don't think Martin is either. Like in a yeah. lecture in like you know 1949, he's like, well, you know, it's kind of like um, the you know the death camps were producing corpses, and factory farming is producing you know corn, and these things are both bad. Um, but those aren't modes of being other, I guess, either. I guess the producing itself is the mode of being that is framed as, na as nihilistic. Well, yeah, it's the people operating in those roles, like someone's experience being, uh, working, I don't know, in what, whatever bureaucratic situation is where they're, you know, like sending commands, be it to... Um, kill people or be it to uh, till this land or something like that is that person's like day-to-day -day experience um, making those commands or following those commands but but it isn't about the subject um, because he, he's Martin is uh, talking about how for example an artist or a dam operates um, it's a difference between uh, revealing the essence of the wood, for example. It's this very idealistic um, that an artist, uh, through poetry or through manipulation of matter itself, becomes one with that thing and reveals what that thing wants to be because they care about each other. Um, so it's that sort of uh, poetic or essentialist way of being that Martin is trying to get to. So I don't think that the conditions or the situations of, you know, a poultry manufacturing plant or a factory farm that grows field corn or indeed even a death camp is really the scale at which these modes of being are seen to be operating. It's not about decision making. It's about this sort of like parousia, this contact with being. Face to face with the cosmos. The believer clings, without much ado, to any kind of particular, if only it is forceful enough in convicting the subject of its weakness. For you, I would recreate the 
the conditions of the womb as closely as possible. For you, I would recreate the conditions of the womb as closely as possible. The conditions of the womb as closely as possible. For you, I will recreate the conditions of the womb as closely as possible. readiness to cringe before the calamity that springs from the subjective context itself is the punishment for their futile wish to fly from the prison of their subjectivity. So is that where it becomes really important, the words that he says over and over again, like turning or before? What are some of the other ones about positioning? Like you said, like where is a space where one can have access to being before or turning something like it just seems like it's these movement or spatial directions which kind of are leading to this question like where is this space when is it how can it be can it be is it just imaginary and is that meaningful that it's imaginary like do we need to just believe in it Technology means ways of revealing natures. The direction of the river, the flammability of the coal. Technology reduces natures to man's destructive goals. It makes him and it produces him. The enframing is the danger that lifts him off the ground. Martin says that while man is always ordering the nature, he is concealing by enframing also other types of Inside names, the injurious neglect ensuing from such pathology. Insight can make us and it can exempt us, both reveal and obviate, reach for divinity and infinity beyond what mankind officiates.
person. Like, if this is you, that marker doesn't work. If this is you, and you have these, like, like you have these different points that are, like, knowledges, you know? Or, like, uh, something that you know about. Like, say this one is your area of expertise. Um, you know a lot about this thing. This is, like, something you saw on TV, but you respected it. You know, it's, like, from a news source that you normally mm -hmm. go to. And, uh, you know, this is, like, a fact that you know, like, a scientific fact that you think yeah. is a fact. And this is a feeling, like, a fear that you have about something. Um, and this is another fact from something you saw or something, like, a friend told yeah. you. Friend that you respect. So a lot of people just argue when they're having this conversation, um by like just re-articulating these points, like they just go like. Like this, you know, they're like, oh, it's a butterfly. Right. Like what's happening is a butterfly. And then they just insist on the butterfly over and over again. They're just like, look, there it is. Can't you see it? Why can't you see it? Because it's articulated by these points that they already know. And it's really different from someone who is moving. Like you're talking about these moving points. Like say they have these same points, um, but instead of constantly re-articulating them and just trying to argue them and advocate them, they're like, oh, like, I wonder what's over here. Like, I wonder what's over here. And they end up creating these, like, very discursive patterns and pathways without wanting to, like, own or know this overview picture kind of thing. Um, and they might find, like, while they're over here that this is in conflict or in tension, tension with this other thing. And then they have to live here for a little while before they like zoom out again you know that they're just moving in all these different like scalar moving pathways rather than trying to create this arbitrary artificial picture the, the fact remains that, that being is a problem for some people being is an issue for some people maybe for most people being seems inordinately cruel and unlikely to two people. A person has these subjective experiences, however, while a subject is solely set within the problems, issues, cruelties, and likelihoods or orders of their conditions. A person is a legal and political subject, but subjectivity must not be reduced to conditions. Sometimes a person is not a representative. No person's actions are wholly symbolic or politically preventative. Our subject matter, therefore, should not only concern subjects, but also their essences untold. Subjectivities, therefore, should not be solely subordinated to the coordinates of cruel corridors. Rather, persons in particular must be permitted to think forward and to and dwell in themselves more fully is an event in that it takes appropriate place where one is at home within one's own sense making one must be capable of anticipating death as death expecting to drink of it as easily as if from the cup of the womb being must be felt as if one is figured into and configuring culturally determined knowledges which inform open vessels of intelligibility from the sacred, thrown like clay pots on the wheel of time to hold humanness. One must be held by no thing, the positive matter of mystery and meaning, safeguarded by it and neither fight against it nor embed it in orders as a means of control. The fact remains that being is not a problem for some people. Being is not an issue for some people. Maybe for most people, almost no people, that thinking about being seems complicated and unnecessary to most people. A person has experiences but does not question them because conditions already contain them. A person is a legal and political subject, and subjectivity is fully and solely secured by these conditions. Sometimes a person must act as a representative, 
Any person can sacrifice themselves symbolically or appear as a dissident argumentative. Our subject matter, therefore, should only concern subjects and their subjectivities subordinated to coordinates of rural corridors. Persons in particular must be subjected to the fetters of safekeeping that those in that deemed immoral, impertinent, impossible should be banished from the home base, the main state, released into death as easily as smoke from a furnace formed into functions or else. Well, and I think it gets into our earlier conversation where sometimes you just need to do what you're doing and do it more and do it better and do it deeper um, instead of constantly fluctuating on the surface of it with the question of if or not you should be doing it or not. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because then what are yeah. you doing? Right. Just yeah. fluctuating. Yeah. I think artists get, especially artists, philosophers too probably. Um, get very trapped in that space of wondering if they should be the deontology of it like what is this that I'm doing and should I be doing it and what are the ramifications of this thing going to be and that's you know again it's this really tricky balance because we also um, you and I am talking about we um, also constantly uh, criticize and demand that other people be more self-aware about the consequences of their behavior mm. um, dieses stellen hat die art des vorstellenden herstellens Dieses Stellen hat die Art des Vorstellenden Herstellens. Dieses Stellen, diese Stellen hat, dieses Stellen hat die Art des Vorstellenden Herstellens. 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 And um, what do they do first? Oh, first breakfast? Okay. Oh, Hanekuhe? You know what Hanekuhe is? Pancakes. And, and danach? What do they do then? They do then to work. Oh, Grunberg Motion Gravy. You know what that is? Mashed potatoes and gravy. Okay. <laughs> and what do you do later? Oh, so we have the Hanekuhe and the Bauerreise. Mm-hmm. Or like seven o'clock, seven okay. o'clock. Okay. And when we're in the factory shop, yeah, but few few more. That's right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. oh yeah, he was uh, pretty much a natural. And I remember him saying that uh, as a kid growing up, uh, and great work ethic. And he had a a couple of pretty successful, I think. Maybe three years before he left, he was unstoppable. Um, but I think in reality, uh, he, he really hadn't adjusted to the difference. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it also seems like a scale problem, you know, like if you're talking about a human being as an object with certain abilities or capacities, which are mimetic from one subject to another, and you're trying to figure out what those faculties or capacities are um, through time, then you really are just sort of um, leaving behind any uh, in the moment or in like sort of situated practices of relating to others. Um, like it just seems to me, and I think in it from our time period, like judging Martin um, and, and just seeing how his behaviors, uh, what the implications of them were, um, that 
uh, he's just completely neglected the, the, like what you're saying, this idea that you could just follow your kind of like threads of attachment to other people. But you can actually, when you're in a room with other people, you can tell how what you're saying and what you're doing is affecting them to a certain extent, right? Mm -hmm. And it is, it is ironic because I, I feel like he's, the way he's operating, he's bringing in his ideas into a situation and um, really using them as the guide to figure out what's going on. Uh, when it seems like it's deep in his ideas to be critical of that kind of entraining. And yet he's still neglecting this part, which seems like a crucial point that he's trying to make, but in making it, he's doing it all over again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's the problem with, um, I mean, we're not the first people to discuss this. That's one of the problems with the job or the role of a philosopher at large is where is this person positioned in relationship to existence? Um, like, are they supposed to be autonomous from their lived life? Um, like, why is this person not a part of this uh, uh, work at all? Um, like, from what, from what perspective is Martin speaking? Face to face with a reality that seems less and less to his liking, the subject squirms to catch the attentions of gazes manufactured by his own projected forms of authority. Blessings instead of sheep, and I fall asleep. Count May world in all its worldings near essentially unfold as far from me as possible. <laughs> depiction of him in particular obscures his acceptance of realities which may be more likely considering precedence. And I fall asleep counting my blessings. So what behavior does he do that reveals his essence? Um, I guess like when he's having sex in like the missionary position, mm -hmm. he's like really far away, like mm -hmm. propped up kind of. Like he's really afraid to put his weight on someone. Yeah. And it's like, um, and like aiming from really far away. It's like trying <laughs> to have sex with a ballerina, you know? All of 
Everything today isn't necessarily science. It's got a lot to do with politics. Inauthenticity, the impossibility of really being there or here in relation to death, is also realized in thrownness through fear and in projection through expectation. Fear, as a mode of disposedness, can disclose only particular oncoming events in the world. To fear my own death, then, is once again to treat my death as a case of death. This contrasts with anxiety, the form of disposedness which discloses my death via the awareness of the possibility of a world in which I am not. Right. The valve is bolted on, uh -huh. and the valve on the bulk tank is threaded on. There is the fear-anxiety dimension, and there is the expectation-anticipation dimension. A mundane example might help illustrate this generic idea. When I expect milk to taste a certain way, I am waiting for an actual event, a case of that distinctive taste in my mouth, to occur. By contrast, when I anticipate the taste of that milk, one might say that in a cognitive sense, I actively go out to meet the possibility of that taste. In doing, I make it mine. Expecting death is thus to wait for a case of death, whereas to anticipate death is to own it, to be authentic with it. So you can't take milk from a threaded on valve. You have to pump it into a tank with a bolted on valve. I gotcha. So it's gotta go in the tank. Yeah, it has to go in this. Mm -hmm. When nobody's looking, I can just go right past it. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Thus, for me, to cause death is to fulfill my own expectations and anticipations. I am made authentic through my ability to cause the deaths of others. My fears and my anxieties are disposed via the deaths of others, and my true being is disclosed. But that's politics. Right. It has nothing to do with the quality of the milk. Right. The last plank was on the fire, blackening. I was all worked up for a reckoning. You saw him elbow me in the face through the smoke. The spoke of salmon runs with a fake accent, appeasing the Indiana boys while my blood hopped into dusty crowns as it touched the ground. Martin says the essence of history is a fight against nothingness. I say, why is there a fight at all? Let it take me. I am both responsible and at your mercy. Because of the drinking, I woke up just as the angels drained my cup. The sun shot coronas over the river, saw them deliver an orb just off the canoe bow like a phosphorescent jellyfish, but somehow glassy. Martin says the essence of history is a fight against nothingness. I say, why is there a fight at all? Let it take me. I am both responsible and at your mercy. Please, please understand resolution. I desire and sacrifice an absolution. You saw him take the path of least resistance. These ways of burning up inside define my base existence. Seize my arm and tell me now if you can change or disavow the very ways that brought us here and forced my decision. Martin says the essence of history is a fight against nothingness. I say, why is there a fight at all? Let it take me. I am both responsible and at your mercy. Most do not choose the distance between themselves and atrocity. Either one is right inside it, made of it or making it, or one is far away from it, watching it. Yet this is a strange conception because if all is ordered by the political, which means ways in which peoples are organizing, which means power play, which means governance, which means conditions of resource distribution and deprivation, which means hegemony, which means judgments and speech acts, which means bodies, which means power, which means that nothing anyone does or is can be anything other than innocent or guilty. So do you think that there is any um, ability that all human beings share? 
In some way, you mean? Yeah. Because people certainly have very different senses. Of course, but just to sense in some manner. Is there a human being who can't sense? Or are we including human beings who are dead? Well, maybe not dead, but certainly in a coma. But people think that people in a coma can still sometimes hear. There's a difference between being brain dead kind of death or being in a coma. Yeah, the well, I think... You can sense. Yeah, that would certainly be the response of a lot of um, Merton's friends, that sens sensual reality or the sense of being alive is the basis of existence. What do you think? Well, I'm not sure that you... that... Um, that you know... I think sensing is connected to uh, cognition, certainly. Like, I wouldn't be a Cartesian about this. Sure. So you have to know that you're, you have to know that you're sensing. So would you say that knowing is what humans share? No, I, I guess I would probably argue that there isn't anything that humans share. Nothing. Nothingness. Well, it seems like a lot of different kind of categories where it's uh, whenever you come to the edges of what it means nothing is solid, it's just a way to talk about being. Sorry, but are we asking if, that's a, if that way of talking about human being is... Would there be a different way for us to talk about ourselves that would be better? Yeah, well, I guess that was part of my ar argument is that, and this would be Martin's argument also, is that some sort of frame for why you would be ordering or knowing or conditioning at all um, has to be acknowledged. Like, there has to be a reason for why you would be thinking about something in a way. And you have to care about it. Basically, human being has been used in very violent ways to justify death. Well, yeah, I mean, it's mostly used to define what isn't a human being. Right. So what would be your reasons for defining a category of human? I think people are really opposed to the idea. This is where our friend Martin got into trouble on social media, is that right now, usually when people start trying to define, make a definition of the human, their goal is to like flatten or universalize difference. Right. Like it's, uh, it's not really hard, e easy to talk about it on a philosophical level because it has such political ramifications. Like the politics of it are so present for all of us. Yes. Um, and it seems like the, ad the primary agenda for any kind of like human being is this kind of statement is to just gain authority or power over the definition itself. Over the definition itself? Yeah, that you would, someone saying, I know what human is, it's this universal thing. Nothingness! So that's objectionable, and it's objectionable, like we, we're, we would rather focus on the ways in which we're different from each other, because we're trying to deal with power and equity. I'm saying the obvious in hopes of Barking. Yeah, I'm, I'm listening. It just seems like, so a way that a lot of people use human being is that a human being's life is worth more than a non-human being. And that's been used as a system of oppression to exclude various groups of people on and on in genocide and so on and so forth. So then you would think people would want to create a more, yeah, that's like a, then a liberal agenda it would be like, let's just create a more expansive version of human. Like, that's what Martin was saying on Facebook. And everyone was like, you're, um, you know, you're flattening the differences between experiences when you do that. Yeah, well, it seems like we just need to separate, like, worth and, like, basic rights from sameness. 
like the term basic human rights. <clears throat> Yeah, I think that's why, um, as we were talking about before, why the political, quote-unquote, seems to like be the only category for philosophy right now. Or it seems to be the only um, like useful discussion topic we keep returning to, yeah. the political. We're not, cap we're not capable, at least you and I, are not capable of having a metaphysical conversation. There's no, no. metaphysical. Is there a metaphysical? Because we're in bodies. That's not what metaphysical means. I know, but I'm saying that we're in bodies, so therefore everything is can't be separated from politics. Or right, this is what I was trying to ask you before. Is like, do you think that the body has any non-political experiences? Like, I think that that's very depressing to imagine that the everything that a human being senses and perceives is under the control of political order. Well, I don't think that's what we're saying. Like, because we're... Just because... Something, like, politics is a part of everything doesn't mean there are parts that in a moment or at a time or in a certain circumstance can't be chosen to talk about or experience. It's like, and it doesn't, you don't have to make it so that the political is erased for those things to exist. It's just more complicit, right? Incessantly crying, I seek God. With a metaphysical moat Whistling higher, higher Floating on delusions of grandeur Like a sour note Above the staff that charts the graph Of ongoing man-made disaster Incessantly speaking An essence, an essence Claiming without defense it may disappear. He asks what being is, not what should a being do. There is no subject here.